Okay, uh, we're so excited. <laughs> hey, thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm delighted to oh be here. Oh my goodness, Julie, I'm dying. Yes, we love you Why? so Cause much. Because we just uh, are so excited for this interview yeah. and just to hang out with you. <laughs> so sweet. Okay, tell me a little bit about you. I want to make sure I have your names and I know what we're up to here. Okay. Uh, this is Chris, my husband. Um, Hi, Chris. Hi. And I'm G Hey, and it G. rhymes with like. The letter G, and like you're saying, hey. That's how I remembered it when I, I first met. <laughs> like, G, what's that girl's name again? Hey, it's G Hey. Yeah. Uh, G Hey will actually be easier for me to remember than I've already forgotten your husband's Chris. name. Chris. Yep. <laughs> was it? Chris. 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 Yeah. Got you. Yeah. Okay. And awesome. then, yeah, we're here in Arizona, and um, what's that like? It's different. It's actually gorgeous right now. So this is like the little blanket we have. It's still a little hot. Like it's still in the nineties. Yeah. And I'm only wearing a sweater because we're in my office, um, and it's freezing in the office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what city are you in? We're in uh, Chandler, Chandler, which is a burb near um, Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. We have yeah. seven kiddos, seven kids. ages 27, 13, 12, 10, 8, eight almost 9, um, and then two fives. Who are five months apart. Yes. So they're not twins. Yeah. 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 And it's funny because, like, our 27-year-old definitely, I mean, we adopted her this last year. And she's only lived with us for the last two years. Yeah. So it's funny, like, when we read things about, like, overparenting and, like, things uh, that her friends go through. And I'm like, you were definitely not helicopter parented because yeah. no one really parented her. So I'm like, you're crushing it, actually. She is crushing it. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, people have asked me, you know, why are you so worried about overparenting? Isn't underparenting the problem? And I say, yes, underparenting, neglect mm -hmm. is a huge problem. It's a different problem. Yeah. Overparenting tends to be present in families that have means, that have time and money mm -hmm. to devote to curating their child's every moment, mm -hmm. and it undermines a child's agency and the chance to build resilience. So they emerge, they seem, they look, they sort of are the picture of maybe even privilege, but right. they lack the internal stuff to move themselves forward. For sure. Yeah. So it's a totally different type of harm that accrues. You know, actually kids who've had a tough childhood can emerge from that childhood with tremendous strengths mm -hmm. absolutely around resilience and mm -hmm. agency yeah, because they've her. only been able to count on themselves mm -hmm. and right. so they know how to yeah. they know how to make things happen and they have i'm not trying to um, romanticize a childhood that entailed struggle or suffering but it is to say that one can emerge from such an upbringing Right. with skills that more better off people ask when people just lack. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. So, well, maybe we should start recording. This I know thing I was going to say that was already that. gold. I, yeah, it was too good. But I think Jed, uh, who I work with, he's the best. He's in here and he's helping to he's already do all of all this that. stuff. So I think it's recording. So we're, we'll use that. So if, we'll make it happen. if there's anything that uh, you want us to edit out, just let us know yes, and we'll make sure. a little note or anything like that. Um, and really, we just want you to share your heart because we, we already love you because we've we've read a lot of your uh, your content and the, the things you've shared with us. Mm -hmm. um, so we just we just want everybody else to hear that, too. And as sure. part of our listeners, especially foster and adoptive parents mm -hmm. and families, kiddos. Awesome. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I tend to be quite long winded. And so it's very helpful for me to know how much time you envision for the podcast interview because it helps me kind of decide is it a two minute answer or a 30 second answer mm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. oh definitely go with the two i mean okay. we have until like noon really yeah. so we're, we're on your timeline yeah um, okay. so now, are we in the same time zone yes, yes. we are yeah okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, good. good question yeah. i mean most of our podcasts are about 45 minutes to an hour but Again, the super good ones, people are going to listen to the whole way through, yeah. whether they listen to it in two separate chunks or whatever the case may yeah. be. But, um, yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah. Okay. I want to know what it's like to be Jihei in, in Chandler, Arizona. And I want to know what the races and ethnicities and phenotypical yeah. presentations of your children are. I'm so fascinated to know 
here I am in this very blue part of America mm. where I feel safe being mm -hmm. a person of color and I feel safe being in a interracial relationship and yeah. My two children present to the world phenotypically very differently, so I've had to sort of prepare right. mm -hmm. each one differently for the world they might encounter, whether right. that world is Arizona or the Bay Area or mm -hmm. wherever. And um, so I find myself really interested in knowing what you're willing to share okay. about your own choice and your own journeys and how you are preparing children. I think this gets to what does it mean to raise a child, right? right what does right, it mean absolutely. to, whether it's your own biological child or foster child or adopted child or whomever the child is, you know, our obligation is about more than shelter and food and mm -hmm. love. You know, it's trying to appreciate how that child will show up in the world to strangers and what we can do to equip that child with the tools they'll need to be smart and safe and successful out there. And right. sadly in our country, race and skin color and mm -hmm. other features can be such a determinant of how strangers might interact with you. Yeah. And so raising children who may not be the same race as one or both of you, mm -hmm. you know, adds another layer to oh, even, you know, how do I equip a child for an experience I myself may not have had. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I just find myself curious about that. And this is our, our family. I, I don't think it's going to show up very well, but you can kind of see. We have two yeah. Mexican yeah. girls. Um, our little guy, Wes, is five and he is white. And everyone actually yeah. thinks that he is Chris's son. He, so... He's out of all, all the kiddos. He looks the most like I do. Yeah. But um, not just because he's white. He just looks, looks a like lot Chris. like Chris. Yeah. And so it's super funny. Like, uh, when we first brought him to my parents, who are you know 100% Korean, they were like, "Is they like, thought what kind of actually, weird joke is this? Yeah. Like, did Chris like, have did an Chris affair? Have another, uh, yeah. What's oh, he's going your on?" Biological kid. He's not. He's not. He no. we adopted him through foster oh, did care. Did Chris have an affair? I thought your parents yeah. were saying this is your our biological grandson, so therefore, right. did Chris have an affair? No. Yeah. No. Okay. So yeah, I okay. mean, and we have our three bio kids who are obviously mixed and. Uh, yeah. But then our 27 year old who we've adopted has the exact same like hair color as our eldest bio child. So she mm -hmm. actually does kind of look like she belongs to us, which is funny. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we're just kind of all over the map. Yeah. Yeah. But we can dive into all yes, of that for let sure. Let me stop asking you questions. Yeah, no, this is too, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll edit it in. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll make it all fit in there for sure. Good. I think for like the portion that's going to be on YouTube, like, hello, YouTubers, we're already yeah. on. So yeah. you're, you got all that bonus uh -huh. before the intro. But yeah. uh, Chris will intro us specifically. And then like the uh, podcast is super conversational. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's just have a conversation. You ask us questions. We'll ask you questions. But yeah. we definitely want to hear more from you because everyone yeah. already knows stuff. Yeah, people stuff. are very bored of us. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> I doubt that. But yes. OK, okay I love it. All right. All right. Go ahead. Welcome to Fostering Voices, episode 110. This is Chris. And Jihei. And we are on the season finale with an incredible guest who Possibly we are... Possibly the... I'm, I can't say the best because all of our guests have been so phenomenal. You've been fangirling for a month and just dying of excitement. Dying. So as a lot of you know, uh, we reference this book so often. It's called How to Raise an Adult. It is by Julie Lithcott Hames. This book was actually referred to us by my boss and Chris's cousin, mm -hmm. uh, Todd Watson. And we are in the Show It studio today. And we're super thankful for them and their sponsorship and just like supporting us in everything we do. Uh, it's a regular work day, but I'm podcasting, yeah. which is great. Um, so yeah, so we have Julie Lithcott friggin Hames with us in today. In the house. Like Un unbelievable. Just dying. So welcome, Julie. I am so overjoyed to hear who this Julie person is that you're so excited <laughs> about. Like, wow, I'm excited too. I'm seriously not accustomed to this type of intro. So thank you. You're now officially making my day. And I want to go tell my mother, like, look at these people. Look how much, look how excited they are. You're oh, I would love, I mean, next time, if we can get another episode on yes. with you, bring your mom. Yeah. I would I'm, love to chat dude, with her too. We're all on the same property here together. So oh, I, my could, goodness. I could, in fact, make that happen. And that would be a great conversation. Oh, I love it. No, anytime you want to come on the podcast, Julie, you are welcome. I mean, if you want to co-host this bad boy with uh -huh. us, we'll write you in. We feel That's like, fine. We feel like we know your family because you also wrote Real American, uh, which we all loved. And that's that's your story, sharing your story and, and some of the things that you've gone through in your life. And uh, 
Um, and both of these books ha have moved both of us quite oh a bit. Oh my goodness, so and, amazing. And changed our lives. Yes. So. And we technically, I mean, I had to buy these on uh, Amazon because we actually read them via Audible, yeah. which just the, all the more made us feel like, man, we are friends with Julie. Like she yeah. has read to us. She has talked to us about her life. Uh -huh. uh, admittedly, like there are just some portions in Real American, which you know, you kind of have to understand it as a, a journey, like mm -hmm. it is your journey. And yeah. so there are just so many parts that I was like, no way, I can't believe that happened to you. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Oh, I have a similar experience. Like yeah. you talked about, um, you know, growing up, I think in Wisconsin and you're one of the few black children in the school and there was a black boy and you're like, well, I guess we should go to the mm -hmm. dance together because we're both, we match, you know? And I was like, oh my goodness, that happened to me in Toronto when I went to this uh, junior high and there was this, Chinese kid named Howard and I'm Korean and I was like, well, Howard, what do you think? And like we went and it was the worst. And I was like, why did I do that? This is the dumbest, one of the dumbest things I've ever done. Um, but it's such a beautiful journey. So good. And there were just parts of it too, where you're like, I felt like a little uncomfortable with some of, you know, the race things. Obviously we we're living in a very racially tense mm -hmm. time. Um, but again, remembering that one, this is your life and you actually lived it, but it's like, it was a chapter in this book and the next chapter kind of was like, not necessarily redeeming it, but like helped us to like keep going on yeah. the journey with you. Uh, I feel like, you know, obviously the parts were like your daughter, you have two kids mm -hmm. and, um, and Avery, your daughter, she's younger and she is lighter than your son. And so even just all of that, like you, everyone just read this book. It is so... Fantastic. You're giving away the whole book. I know. I'm sorry. It's too good. Oh, uh, there we go. Avery and Sawyer. Yes, we are Sawyer. looking at pictures. That uh, they are both beautiful children. Thank so you. Glorious. And they are two years apart. This is their high school graduation. Uh -huh. um, Sawyer now has an enormous afro that just comes out to like wow. here. Um, Avery's hair is still pretty much the same as it was in this photo. So, um, but yeah, these are these are my two amazing kids and they're now 21 and 19 and um you know uh all of my work has been this it's sort of intersection of what i know professionally what i've learned in my personal life mm -hmm. i write nonfiction, and because i'm interested in the actual truth of yeah. the human experience mm -hmm. um i'm interested in trying to summon the bravery to tell what our human experience actually feels like yeah. mm -hmm. I know that in so doing we not only heal ourselves from whatever wounds are sort of lurking within us or, or pains or, or tumors are embedded in us you know as a result of our experience but we can also then connect so beautifully with others when we can dare to be vulnerable and mm -hmm. say this is how I felt or this is what I did mm -hmm. you yeah. know this is a choice I might be ashamed of but in talking about it and helping myself understand why I did those things mm -hmm. and who I was in that moment, we can heal and we can help others. And that's, that's what I'm here to do kind of at a meta level. Yes. Healing and helping others. I love that so much. Um, and you have a, a heart specifically for kids growing up in foster care. Um, on your, on your website, you talk about the the universal truth is that everyone wants to know that they matter, mm. and and I think this hits home so much for for kids in foster care. What what kind of uh, words of wisdom can you give us um, just on 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 that and on how we can uh, be better to each other to uh, the kids that are coming into our care and, and so forth. I am feeling the need to say why I have uh, this heartfelt feeling for kids in foster care, but I think you're going to ask me about that in a second. So I'm going to hit, just go for all of it. Go, go for, for it all. Now? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, but I think it is this. Okay. Um, I'm just moving my screen here because I saw the shaft of light come in and hit me in the face or distort <laughs> the screen. Um, um, I have a brother okay. who was adopted out when he was two and a half hmm. and I didn't know of his existence. He's nine years older than me. Okay. 
and I did not know of his existence and he's eight years old with me. So I didn't know of his existence until I was 10 okay. and he was 18. Um, so my mother took me for a walk when I was 10 to tell me that she had another child hmm. who was my brother who she'd had to give up for adoption um, because she felt she couldn't care for him. Um, she had had him when she was 19 and her boyfriend died and before the baby was born and she was alone and, you know, just treated very badly. It was in England in 1959, mm -hmm. different era. She was a white woman. Um, I point that out because I'm black and biracial. So this mm -hmm. is my white parent. This is happening to And mm -hmm. my brother is a white male. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, she had, she was allowed to get back in touch with him when he was 18 Oh wow! and did, and they were starting to connect. And my mother felt therefore I needed to know about this mm -hmm. thing that she was going to go spend a month with. Oh wow! And, um, and, and so I remember that walk when I looked, I'm 52 years old. There's not a whole lot of detail I remember from being 10, <laughs> but I remember that walk. Mm -hmm. I remember being angry you know, in that sort of selfish child sort of way, mm -hmm. like self-centered child sort of way, like, why didn't you tell me I yeah. have a brother? Right. Kind of making it about me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't mad that I had a brother. Mm -hmm. I was excited that I had a brother. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was growing up as an only child. I didn't, you know, my dad had had kids from his first marriage, but they're a lot older. Mm -hmm. So I think I was just sort of like, how could you have kept this brother from me? Mm -hmm. And what she said was, she sort of nodded and validated my emotions. And she then said, I, I needed you to be old enough such that you wouldn't worry about whether I was going to give you up for adoption. Mm. And I really got it in that moment mm -hmm. that for a parent to tell a child that she or he, or they have given another child away, might be hard for that child then how does that child have confidence that that same set of circumstances won't happen mm. and i really got it um and then of course when i got much older and had my own children and had my own two and a half year old mm -hmm. compassion i felt for my mother mm -hmm, who had mm -hmm. taken a two and a half year old and, and handed him lovingly to someone else you know i just wept yeah with passion for my mother so I think my care and concern for kids in foster care actually comes from knowing that my sibling was taken in essentially by other people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. feeling in retrospect or, you know, in, right. I didn't know him when he was going through that, right. but I knew him starting at his age 18 mm -hmm. and now into adulthood. I have tremendous compassion mm. retroactively yeah. for mm -hmm. what, that must have been like for him. I'm mm. fairly certain. Yeah. That that's from. Mm, I um, love that. So to the mattering, mm. you know, whether you're a very downtrodden, discarded person, because society and circumstances in life has done that, or you're seemingly successful and they've made it and you're sort of the paragon of corporate America success mm -hmm. i'm not you know that's just a strain right. that's a continuum from the have nots to the haves mm -hmm. that's what I'm gonna draw. regardless of where you are in this continuum we have a need to know we matter yes. to feel yeah. loved and safe in our being we want people to look us in the eye regard us in a manner that seems kind like yeah. the countenance of the faces mm -hmm in front of us, tell us if we're okay. Right. You know, we are mirrored in the look on someone's face as they look at us, tells us, us a lot about what that person seems to think, but becomes a message to us about how we are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until we can really do the work and get old enough and return up. Like, it doesn't matter how somebody right. looks at me. Right. I'm good. I know who I am. But as a child, yeah. yes. you know, we are social species and children yeah. very young. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not trying to quote anybody's research here, mm -hmm. but right. I have read that, you know, children from quite a young age can learn to scan mm -hmm. eyes and faces. Yeah. You know, we react, we, we know whether we're safe mm -hmm. based yeah. on the look on the faces of the people we see. So, so for a child in foster care, whose life has been tumultuous, whose, whose birth situation didn't quite work out or isn't working out right now, 
you know, that child needs, who knows what they've experienced by the time they've gotten to you. Mm-hmm. If you're the foster parent, foster family, what you've got to try to do, and gosh, this is just making me so emotional. Mm-hmm. And this is killing Jihei because I know she wants to jump through the <laughs> monitor and give you the biggest hug. Yeah. I mean, you've got to like try to fill that child's bucket. Yeah. yeah. Like your face in every moment has to be like, I love you. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I'm here for you. Yeah. Without it being this emotional, right? Yeah. They don't need you to have take pity or, oh no, you poor thing, right? So we've got to regulate our own emotions and get all this out of the way <laughs> and be like, okay, right? Right. I just go for this kid strong and kind. Yeah. This kid needs to learn they can trust me. Mm-hmm. Having come from a place where maybe there's a deficit of trust, right? right? we all want to be treated with kindness and dignity Mm -hmm. and maybe for a child who's in the system, they've not necessarily always been treated with kindness and dignity. So the foster family has this work to do to try to repattern for that Mm -hmm. kid, the ability to trust others and love themselves. And God, if that isn't God's work, I don't know what is. Yeah. I think what you said about your mom, you know, being able to talk to you and say, I had to tell you when you were kind of old enough to understand. I think it's we've in these in this last year we've adopted one of our five year olds who's a little girl and she came to our home when she was four. But our son also who we adopted who's also five and again not twins with the other five year old. Um, and we've had him since he was three days old. And he is just now coming into a space where he is asking more questions about where he came from. And it's n- never been. A surprise that he's adopted. Mm-hmm. He knows we've been reading stories since he was a baby that, oh, some kids have an adoption story and some kids don't. And, you know, but we're your parents and you have another mom who gave birth to you and we're thankful for her. And on Mother's Day, we pray for her and we're thankful for her. Um, but it's interesting talking to our two different five year olds who have two very different stories and explaining to them. I think both of them at some point this last year were kind of like, well, when am I moving on? Mm-hmm. You know, and so for our four-year-old who just came yeah. and joined us uh, just a couple nights ago, I was we were talking about her mom, and I was like, hey, do you ever think about how you might have to leave here again? And she's like, yeah, I do. And I was like, okay. Like, you're not going to. Like, I'm your mama. Like, I know that for you, you had a mom, and you thought she was going to be your mama forever. That's a normal thing for her kids to think, that you are going to be my mom forever. And so it's a very strange thing to one day, I think even for our 10 year old is even more strange for her to be like, tell me again why I don't live with my mom. You know what I mean? Like, it's very strange. And so having at least that recognition of like, man, kids, there's a lot going on in kids' minds. There's a lot going on in parents' minds. And to be able to have that communication bridge of like, I'm sorry you're upset that I didn't tell you for 10 years that you had a brother. Mm-hmm. But I needed you to understand, like, you're not, ne- I'm never going to give you away. That was something that mm-hmm. happened. It was, you know, X, Y, Z things. And then for us, with our foster children, with our adoptive kids saying, man, we understand you don't live with that mom anymore, but you will live with us forever. I don't want to explain to them, maybe we'll die in a car accident one day. There's no guarantees. <laughs> we'll cross that bridge another day. But yeah. for now, as much as it's in our control, we will be your parents yeah. till the day we die. You know, yeah. it, it really does highlight the uncertainty and, and exactly that, that there there's so much going on in their uh, their brains yeah. that that sometimes we look past and and don't pay enough attention yes. to um, that is, is so important. The fact that you're, you're remembering that from when you're 10. I remember things from around that same mm-hmm. time frame that it's, it's amazing when you recollect and, and wonder why you remember these things. But. Uh, but being aware of that, mm-hmm. that our, our kids are paying attention. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting too, you know, you are so much of what you talk about in the book, how to raise an adult is like not over parenting your children, not being a helicopter parent. And you just had, uh, an article come out yesterday that I read most of, and you talked about stealth parenting, which is, you know, like basically tracking your kids via, you know, cyber land. Um, but there, it was interesting. You talked about a boy who uh, his mom called him like three times a day so Mm -hmm. I missed this part of the intro 
for Julie, for those of you who, for whatever reason, don't know who she is. You know, she was the Dean of Freshmen at Stanford. She went to Stanford. She also went to Harvard uh, Law School, which is insane. Uh, and I mean, you're just so educated, but also just your heart is so tender to humans mm -hmm. and, you know, everyone's experience and wanting to hear all of those things. Um, but back to this boy that you uh, kind of walked alongside at Stanford and he said, you know, his mom called him three times a day and he was like, oh my gosh, the only voice I hear in my head is your voice, mom. Mm -hmm. And like, he threw his phone and like, didn't talk to her for a couple of years and you're just like, okay, we can't do that, yeah. you know? Um, but just that, that fear or the overparenting piece uh, and not listening to your kids and just telling them, hey, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. Um, give us some, some nuggets of wisdom on like... I've been guilty of everything you've oh, written obviously. in your books, obviously. by the way. Every, this, even <laughs> yeah. the, when, when uh, Jihei was uh, reading through this stealth parenting, I was like, yep, I'm guilty of that, I'm guilty of that. And Which fortunately our kids are still young, like they're 13... They're and still, she's not on social time. media. Yeah. All There's those time things. to fix it. And even the how to raise an adult, we read this uh, what three three or four years ago, and and we it forced us to pivot mm -hmm. in in how we parented, and it's not that's that's what I love about it is it's not too late oh, to sure. to get better. It's never too late to grow as as parents as people, and and so so yeah so moving moving forward from that. So I'm gonna draw a chart. Yes. Okay. I love charts. Which we can show because we're on, this is the upside of this strange moment of everything being virtual. Yes. You can use close up visuals. Um, so I'm going to do that um, because I think the inherent question is, well, we know that underparenting is bad, yes. right? We know yes. that we're not supposed to, you know, some kids are neglected and abandoned and abused and obviously we don't want that. So, so people will say in my talk, so what are you saying? We should just like turn around and let our kids drown. Mm -hmm. Right. And people I are say, so dumb. Yeah. Like, no, that's <laughs> not what I'm saying. Um, but let me try to say what I am saying. Hold okay. on. Um, I'm just drawing here a Cartesian chart, an XY chart. Okay. Um, that's going to have four quadrants. Mm -hmm. And um, hold on. You don't have to grab it yet because it's going to have all kinds of words in it. I love okay? it. Okay. Go. So. This is the chart. According to the parenting experts, yes. um, the right way to parent is a function of how demanding we are. Okay. You know, demanding meaning you have rules, you have expectations, mm -hmm. you know, and how responsive we are to their needs and wants. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's sort of rules and kindness, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, matter. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So, for sure. um, so, so we don't, so a parent who's, not at all demanding of a child mm. and not at all responsive. You know, they have no rules. They have no boundaries. Right. They just, they're basically absent. You know, yeah. this is yeah. neglectful. Mm -hmm. I'm putting it in red because we don't want to be that. Right. Okay. Right. And kids coming who are in the system might have been in an environment where that was the case. Most, you know, neglectful or maybe even abusive. Okay. So um, then there's the uh, very demanding but not at all responsive to a kid's needs. Mm. That's the my way or the highway, right. my room, right. my house. That's the authoritarian. Hmm. And that can feel cold and cruel. Kids with authoritarian parents can be afraid of them. Hmm. There's no you know, responsiveness to the kid's needs. Okay, down here, this is where, so a lot of helicopter parents are authoritarian types. They're, hmm. you will be a doctor, you will be a brain surgeon, you will be a tennis star, mm -hmm. you know, you will be this, and I will condition my love for you on whether you are this. So right. it's sort of a fear-based parenting approach. And that's, you can be a helicopter and be doing that type. Or mm -hmm. the helicopter, the other type of helicopters are over here, which is the highly responsive to kids' needs, mm -hmm. but not at all, no rules, mm -hmm. no boundaries, no mm -hmm. expectations. This is the indulgent, permissive parent who's like, I just want to be your best friend, or I mm -hmm. am my kid's best friend. Right. Okay? No rules, uh, just serving, serving the kids' needs, like bringing them whatever they, rescuing them, mm -hmm. 
um, having a hard time saying no. Okay, I've wrote written all of these in red because I'm saving my green marker for what we're supposed to aim for, which is authoritative. Mm -hmm. Not authoritarian, but authoritative. Okay, and this is in my book uh, for people who are like, I can't get this from the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, authoritative. It's highly demanding. You're supposed to have expectations around how they behave. You know, we have family rules. We have expectations. We have setting boundaries. If we cross them, there will be consequences. Right. And right. we're highly responsive to your needs. We care about you, mm. about what you want and how you're doing and how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. That's where we're supposed to be. The question is then, how do we, what does being an authoritative parent look like? Right. And right. it's things like appreciating at a philosophical existential level, our children are gifts from God or the universe or however you believe we mm -hmm. get here. We are the grown ups fortunate enough to have this child in our lives. Mm -hmm. There's a humility. Mm -hmm. This child is not me. Yeah. They are not my pet. Okay. Right. They're a pet dog will never, you know, be able to figure out how to poop and let himself back into that. I mean, like maybe, right? Like dogs are, are forever going to be pets. Yes. Okay? A child is not your pet. Mm -hmm. A child is tiny to start with and needs to learn a lot, but they are supposed to become this freestanding human who can thrive when we're dead and gone. Mm -hmm. We have to parent for the day when we're dead and gone. Yeah. And hope yeah. that it doesn't yep. come in an untimely manner. Mm -hmm. Okay. We point being, we're supposed to teach our kids everything they need to know to be able to survive and thrive without us. Yes. And that's something we have to get in our hearts and in our egos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not here to shape a child into a this or that, yeah. whether it's a tennis star or a concert pianist or, you know, whatever it's it, how arrogant, mm -hmm. right? Arrogant. I, this child will be a, this, who yeah. are you right. yeah. to decide that this child has a sense that we can help them uncover of what are you good at? Mm -hmm. What do you love? Yeah. A joyful life of work is at the intersection of what I'm good at and what I love. Yes, for sure. Okay. For if you're, sure. if you just love it, you're probably not going to make a living at it. Mm -hmm. And if you're good at it, but you don't love it, you know, you'll feel like a drone in your yeah. own life going through the motions. Well, I'm good at this, so right. you better keep going. Right. That's not joy. Mm -hmm. But joy is available when we do what we're good at and what we love. I could draw another diagram here, but I don't want to take up too much time. So we're supposed to be helping our kids figure that out. Yeah. What am I interested in instead of what do I want my kids to be interested in? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be teaching them skills. There's a four-step method for teaching any kid any skill. First you do it for them, then you do mm -hmm. it with them, then you turn the tables and you're still there, but you watch them do it. And then finally they can do it independently. Right. I have a lovely little animated video on my website that, um, shows these steps. It's adorable. We will um, definitely so, link to that. So we're supposed to teach them these things instead of doing everything for, mm -hmm. we're supposed to delight in them growing more and more skilled. And we're supposed to be scanning our homes for opportunities for our kids to learn. You know, mm -hmm. there are families that will pull There are these toddler chairs that you, they're sort of like ladders for toddlers, yeah. not really chairs. They're, they're sort of big sturdy ladders that you can pull right up to a kitchen counter. Yep. So yeah. your two-year-old and three-year-old can be next to you at the counter and you're chopping something with a grown-up knife, but they can be chopping mm -hmm. something with a toddler appropriate knife Right. in it with you, learning how, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, every skill starts that way, right? Yes. They don't, you, it looks like, how's that two-year-old going to ever learn to tie their shoes? Well, they're going to learn if you let them, if you teach them and teach them and teach them and they get to try it and Right. At some point they learn we have we have kids these days, high schoolers who can't unscrew the top of a juice drink. They right. lack the yeah. mind the motor dexterity. and the bicep yes. strength <laughs> to do it. Why? Because yeah. they've never had to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A perfect everyone can picture that Gatorade or that whatever yeah, totally. juice drink is, right? You hand it to your kid who's a soccer player right. and they can't get the cap off. And you're mm -hmm. like, Oh, there's on too tight. No. You have deprived your kid. Mm -hmm. of learning how to do that. Right. They, the only way they'll develop that dexterity and strength 
is by trying and maybe you know for a while they may need your help they yeah. might need you to, but you want to at least have them try mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. at some point they've got to be the ones doing it it's a i think it's a visual we can all kind of get our heads around absolutely and there there are so many examples of that in this book in fact after i think right after we read it i, I was taking my son on a date we went to buffalo wild wings mm. and the waitress asked him what he wanted to drink and he, he froze up and i was like oh my gosh we've told him not to talk if to julie strangers. was here she would be so she angry would, at he, us <laughs> and he, he w wouldn't order his drink right. and i was like oh my gosh this and so that was that was another eye-opening moment that four years ago mm -hmm. you know after we after we read it right seeing you know, seeing those examples it's so true and and i tell parents look you say don't talk to strangers, right. mm -hmm. so they emerge from our homes afraid of strangers. Yeah. But who do you suppose is in their life when they leave our homes? Right. Mm -hmm. Strangers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Roommates, dorm mates, coworkers, mm -hmm. people in stores, people in restaurants. You can see from your beautiful example how you've actually undermined your kid's yeah. ability yeah. to be in the world. Yeah. The rule should not be don't talk to strangers. We have a whole generation of people who won't make eye contact with strangers yeah. yes. can't be kind in the face of a stranger you know don't they're afraid mm -hmm. we've taught them we think we've taught them the world is scary and unsafe and we've harmed them because yeah. it's an overbroad message yeah what we're supposed to do the actual teaching is to teach your kid how do you discern yes one creepy stranger mm -hmm. Out of the sure. vast majority yeah. of humans, we're perfectly fine. Yeah. Yes. That's oh, a man. skill they must develop. Love it. And only develop by seeing the instincts we have. Now, let's let's add as a caveat: try not to let your racism, mm -hmm. your sexism, yeah. your classism, yeah. your yeah. ableism get in the way yes. as you're teaching your kid who, you, right. who they should fear. Because too many of us who are of color have grown up being feared because mm -hmm. people think black and brown people are right. problematic like yeah. try not to pass that on to your yeah. kids yeah. it's you know are we unsafe in this moment how do we know why are we you know our kids need to develop instincts it's not a gps dot that tells us our kids safe oh i can right. see he's at johnny's house he's right. fine it's does he know how to behave yeah what is out there yes. what do you know if i'm not watching right right yeah i mean i feel like something that we talk about with our kids in this digital age like we I hate phones personally. I don't want our kids to have them. Lily is 13. She does have one. She's not allowed on social media, but we say to them all the time. I mean, all of their friends have phones and we're like, listen, if you get caught watching something terrible on your friend's phone, it doesn't matter that that's not your phone. You're still in big trouble. So like you need to recognize like, Hey, someone's doing something inappropriate or our kids have often like they've gone to a friend's house and they're like, oh, they watched just a really scary movie, but I didn't want to be the wimp who walked away. And so now I have nightmares for the next two weeks. I'm like, that's your fault, man. Like, no one told you to stay in that room and watch that scary movie. I've told you time and again, if something's happening that you don't feel comfortable with, I'll come and pick you up. You, you can say, oh man, my mom needs me to come home. I don't care, that's fine. But like, can you stand up for yourself? Can you say, hey, mm -hmm. this is making me uncomfortable. Hey, we shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. This sounds like it's against the law. This <laughs> right. sounds like... This is like, you know, an invasion of someone's privacy. I don't know, like, can we raise our kids to stand up for what they think is right mm -hmm. and for themselves? Yeah. And it's definitely something with our kids, um, and namely, I would say our foster babes that we've adopted, you know, what you're saying, like, they can't look anyone in the eyes. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, hey, if you're asking for something, like a drink of water, like, look at someone and say, may I have some water, please? And like, look at them. And she just always mumbles and looks at the floor. And I'm mm -hmm. like, baby girl, I don't know what's happened to you in your life before you got to our home, but we're going to try to empower you to mm -hmm. recognize you are a strong, powerful girl who like deserves to be heard and who yeah. deserves to get some water when you need it. So like, look people, look people in the eyes and say, tell them what you need and then they'll help you. And so again, who knows? all the baggage that comes with that. But even our kids who are our bio kids, again, also Same. recognizing yeah. we're making mistakes there too and trying to right those wrongs and steer the ship the way it's supposed to go. Yeah. Beautiful. Trying, I don't know, we're failing too, but it's fine. Yeah. We're learning. We're all failing. Let's just failing get that out. Forward. Is, yeah, exactly. We're all imperfect. We are on our own journeys. We're learning. Right. I hope to learn and grow until I draw my last breath. Mm -hmm. I, um, 
you know, I'm out here in my outdoor office. It's a little 96 square foot thing and, and there's a fire pit um, out there and it's just, it's just gas, you know, it's we're not allowed to burn logs here uh, cause of the climate. But mm-hmm. um, I have this circular fire pit and chairs around it. And I, when I have people over and right now we can't do that um, without distancing, but mm-hmm. um, I often sit there in the evening with, I'd say we've had people over for dinner and, and we come outside to sit and I will say, you know, I believe that um, we are all in an act of becoming, that we yeah. are, we don't get to a certain age or stage of life or job and say, I'm done, I've done it, I have arrived, you know, I can just coast. I don't want that. Coasting doesn't feel very good psychologically. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And um, it, there's a complacency and a malaise that sets in. I said, so I'm very interested in, in continuing to grow and I'm interested in where my edges, you know, where, what are opportunities for me to grow in this moment in this life? And, um, and so I say to people, you know, I'd love to just go around and share, what are you working on? Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, what are who are you becoming? And I don't mean like, what's the next job you want, but right. for example, I'm an extrovert. You can see on this call, here we are, we're talking, I don't have trouble jumping in. Mm-mm. I thought in fact might overuse my, my time. And as an extrovert, no I work on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I work on in a restaurant setting or gathered with friends or in the workplace, um, noticing how many people are here Mm -hmm. and what's my fraction of the space. Therefore, Mm. let me be mindful of that. Let me try not to take more than my share and let me just sit on my instinct to fill silence with my own ideas or thoughts or questions, Mm. because I've learned from Susan Cain's work in her beautiful book, quiet, Mm. that introverts need the silence in order to, they need the silence to linger in order to feel, that there is room for them to show up and speak. So if we extroverts take all the airspace, right. literally crowding them out. So that's an example of my of something I'm working on all the time. Mm. And I offer that just as, you know, an invitation to anyone listening, what are you working on? Yes, you know, I love don't that. feel like you're supposed to be perfect. None of us is. Mm-hmm. In fact, perfect is just a terribly elusive, harmful term and goal. Mm -hmm. We are here to learn and grow. And therefore we are often beginners Mm -hmm. at whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that should give you relief, you know, not fear. Relief. It's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You're doing the best you can. Just keep trying. Mm -hmm. Keep trying. Keep being curious about where your opportunities for learning and growth are as a parent and as a human. No, that's so great. Um, In your TED talk, which again, if you don't know Julie. She has this phenomenal TED Talk. On YouTube, it has over a million views, but on TED.com, it has over 5 million views. So that's a lot of viewing, which is fantastic. Um, And so your TED Talk obviously is a very short version of this amazing book. And it's so funny, like I say like, oh, I'll read a book and I'll be like, oh, that could have been a blog post. But your TED Talk definitely warranted being a book, a full length book. So that's fantastic. but in it, you talk about basically what is the remedy of overparenting? Like, why are, are why is that so bad? And your thing is one, you need to make your kids do chores, and two, you need to actually love your children unconditionally. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because those are definitely not things that you know. If I was taking a parenting quiz, like, oh, what are two things that I can do to raise successful adults? Yeah. I'd be like, definitely make them do chores and definitely love them unconditionally. Like, I don't know, I wouldn't have thought those were the right answers. But I mean, it makes so much sense, Mm -hmm. you know, and in that graph that you showed us of the four quadrants of neglectful and authoritarian parents versus the authoritative parent that you want to become, um, you know, I feel like there is that lack of unconditional love in those other quadrants, you know, and a lack of, like you're saying, like self-efficacy and teaching our kids like how am I going to survive if mom dies Mm. or dad dies or, you know, I grow up and go to college. Right. Yeah. You know, I have to say I did the Ted talk second. So did you? Okay. The hardback came out in 2015 and they saw it. They read the book and they were like, Hey, maybe we should let her do a Ted talk. And so it is, I'm glad you felt that the, the uh, talk was worthy, was a worthy companion to a book. <laughs> no, yeah. it was so great. Yeah. I think I heard your TED talk first and then I yeah. read the book. I so that. that's, I totally get that. Yeah. And you have the paperback, which didn't come out until 2016. Okay. And Got so it. it, it, you know, in your life, they did appear in that order. Um, 
I'm, I'm feeling a need to draw something else for you, which I call I the love, arc of, yeah. I'm not sure you can maybe help me. Is this the arc of childhood or the arc of living or mm. the arc of parenting? I'm just going to call it the arc of dot, dot, dot. Okay. Love it. And um, so it's looking like this, the okay. arc of um, something. And it's um, agency is the A, mm -hmm. resilience is the R and character mm. is the C. Um, so I just sort of have, these are the things that we, that our kids' childhoods need to be filled with mm. so that they can emerge healthy and ready mm -hmm. to mm. deal with whatever comes. My new book is on adulting. It's for 18 mm -hmm. to 34 year olds struggling with that phase of life. And I'm very with them in the book in a very compassionate way. It's sort of like, trying to be a deanly voice or an older caring adult voice on the page with them. It's not yeah. a critique of them. It's like, I'm here for you. Like, let's do this. Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but you got it. So mm -hmm. let's go. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, agency and resilience and character show up in that book um, without being chapters. They're just sort of threads that run through. And the point is, this is just another way to think of what we do by way of harm when we over parent. So when we um, over parent, we rob our kids of agency. We're making their choices for them right. in an authoritarian way or in a let me just help and handle everything way. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. I'll handle it. You're robbing your child of agency, which is the sense in, in the mind, in the psyche of I can. Yes. I yes. can do things. Right. When we overparent, um, we damage their ability to build. We undermine the ability to build resilience, which is I can cope mm -hmm. when we handle, fix, manage everything, rescue, you know. They never experience the consequence. They never have that like, ugh. They need to have that because it teaches them next time to do it differently. But also, I can handle it when things go badly. I'm right. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can cope. I'm stronger for next time. Mm -hmm. And then character is undermined when we overparent because we're basically acting like they are the be all and end all. Their needs yes. matter more than our own even. And um, they emerge out into the world as little narcissists, just expecting that everyone will drop everything and, and help. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we're, you know, this is what we get when we, when we parent authoritatively, mm -hmm. you know, in the green box yes. is kids who have developed All those, agency, all resilience mm -hmm. and character and can launch themselves out into the world and wherever they go, you know, these are, are sort of the building blocks. And, you know, when I gave the Ted talk, which was back in 2015, when it first came out, I hadn't yet gotten to this arc concept, mm -hmm. but chores help build mm -hmm. sense yeah. of I can, I'm obligated. I must, it builds character. You know, if it doesn't go well, it can build some resilience, you know, and that unconditional love is just strengthening them around, you know, I have the right to be here. Yep. You know, I am capable I'm cared for, you know, those two things that I happen to choose as examples in the Ted talk are also served in this arc of, I don't know what it's called. Arc of, arc of living, arc of child. Yeah. Like these arc years. of becoming, arc I don't of know. Becoming. Yeah. Uh, um, I just love that so much. And I think as going back to, you know, talking about foster care and foster kids, I think so many of them have that resilience piece you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and that we need to definitely work so hard on helping them with the agency portion of just like, um, giving them that voice of like, Hey, you're okay here. You belong here. Mm -hmm. You have space in this place and of their character, which I think is always undermined as like, Oh, well, you're a foster kid. Right. Not much is going to become of you. Right. Uh, we read, uh, or we're reading, um, Sam Collier. I don't know if you, I dropped off. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, and so he basically was uh, at the orphanage and the orphanage workers were like, you don't want these two kids because nothing is going to become of them. Uh, and so kids just carry all of these labels around with them that I'm unwanted, that I'm a mistake, that mm -hmm. I'm, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And so for us as parents also helping our foster and adopted kids get rid of those labels and putting on the new ones that are, hey, I'm chosen, I'm worthy i'm you know i'm everything that everyone else who hasn't been a foster or adoptive child is you know mm -hmm. uh and just really with that unconditional love and with the with the support and the responsibility and saying hey you're able to do these things you're able to achieve these things and i believe in you yeah you know um 
I have two things coming to mind. One is my new book, Your Turn, How to Be an Adult for 18 to 34 year olds mm -hmm. is part memoir, my stories, part self-help tips and part profiles of 32 guests, I call them, whose lived experience serves the point of the chapter. Mm -hmm. And one of my 32, it's an incredibly broadly diverse compilation of humans, which mm -hmm. is what I just want to do from my heart and head, but also in this moment is a way to demonstrate how we can be anti-racist yes. and anti-everything, yes. anti-inclusive of all on the page. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my 32 guests is uh, a man who grew up in foster care okay. and his story about the low expectations mm. that the social worker had for him. Oh, Anthony, he said he could look around at his foster siblings and see they're just getting promoted up through school without, this is a black man, yeah. black child, long ago, Stanford, Connecticut, um, was reading, was precocious and said to be a problem at school because mm -hmm. he was, you know, smart black kid probably. Right. And, um, would read aloud to his older foster siblings or foster cousins as he called them. Um, and so already had more skill than kids far older than him. And he could see that the public schools were just passing these kids through. Mm -hmm. And he looked at them, it's like, I, I can't be in that environment. So he asked a social worker, um, he said to a social worker in eighth grade, I'd like to go to private school. Mm. And she said, oh, Anthony, private school is not for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he knew then she was saying, oh, you little poor black boy. Yeah. You know? yeah. And he's in, the, he, you know, he ends up saying like, I need to just get her to get me to a school where I can interview. Cause I know yeah. if they listen to me and I can take their test, they will admit me. And that's yeah. what ends up happening. Then he ends up on a college campus an elite college campus uh, where he has a Black Lives Matter incident where he's at a frat party and there's a fight and the cops are called and the police come and they surround Anthony with mm. guns because he's the only black person there. They have made the determination that right. it must be a black student. Mm. Who's the problem here and how he endures that and how he heals from that yes. um, is on the page. And then he's the only guest who's on the page and in, in twice he's in a second chapter because he's now a wellness practitioner and he teaches people mindfulness and yoga mm -hmm. and kind of how to be in charge of themselves and be aware mm -hmm. of their breathing and their bodies and so on, just so that they are okay wherever they go. Yes. And with incarcerated people and he works with CEOs and That's kids amazing. in foster care. And, um, and so Anthony's story, as you just were telling this, I was picturing him and I'm so delighted he's in this book because I think for anybody who's had a life experience that is similar to his, even though he's, you know, he's now in his fifties, mm. um, they're going to feel seen on, yes. on the pages of this book. And that's so important. And while we were, um, talking, I was also drawing this better drawing of my arc situation based it. on what you offered me, which is the arc of becoming. Mm -hmm. And there we have a tiny baby on one side yeah. and this grown up person on the other. And there's the arc. That's how it. you get from one to the other. So, good. so thank you. I the love it. Becoming. Um, it's funny. Our, we have a small group of families that we kind of live life with. We met through our church. Mm -hmm. um, and for the longest time, our text group thread was called how not to raise a-holes uh, yeah. because we were like, oh, we don't want our kids to be punks, you know? Yeah. And then we had talked to friends of ours who um, are like marriage counselors and well, and the husband is actually a psychologist or mm -hmm. something, he's something. Uh, and they were like, you know, I think oftentimes we focus on what we don't want our kids to become and we, it's too much. There's too much of what we don't want them to become. But if you can narrow it down to what you do want them to become, then yeah. you can help them to like hit that mark. That mark is a smaller thing mm -hmm. that you're aiming for. And so they were saying that like kind, compassionate, forgiving people, those are the three qualities yeah. that are found in successful humans. And can we also, you know, try to be raising kids who become adults who are kind, compassionate, and forgiving. And I feel like your book touches on that so much. Mm -hmm. And so our text thread is called, you know, Raising Awesome Adults. Which because, is from your book. Yeah, because that's that's the goal we, we want. We want to raise these kids to become people, one, who know themselves and are confident in who they are, but especially looking at where we're at in society right now and mm -hmm. the hot mess that it is. And I think it's easy to be very discouraged and to be like, yeah. man, we are truly in a handbasket to hell <laughs> and is and the ride is getting faster you know but i think 
with people like you and people who are constantly on an arc of becoming mm -hmm. and like, man, who am I trying to be? How am I trying to be better? Not having that pride of like, oh, I'm amazing. I've given a TED talk. Mm -hmm. I was the dean of yeah. Stanford. I went to Harvard Law and I'm a black woman. And like, you're still in that process of like, I still, there's still more. And I just love that. And I think, um, I think of this girl right now who is getting ready to get married. She's a good, uh, she's a daughter of a family friend of ours. And, you know, she's just kind of in this place where like she just graduated college and she's like, I'm getting ready to get married, but like no one will hire me because I have no job, you know, um, experience, but like I want to be a nurse or I want to be a doctor or whatever. But like looking at our lives in like these quadrants of like, hey, you just graduated school. Mm -hmm. If you need money to go to grad school, you might just need to get a job to get some money to then go to the next phase. And then who knows, you might become a mother in that season. And my motherhood series was like, I was at home for 10 years with my kids. And then I had this like very strange situation where I became a foster mom in that time. But then I also actually started working more, which I really loved mm -hmm. and was like, ooh, I was a stay at home mom for 10 years. And now I'm not a stay at home mom for these kids that I've fostered and adopted. Like, am I doing a disservice to them? Mm -hmm. But in all honesty, I'm not even that great a person to hang out with all day. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> Disagree. You're doing a great job going to this daycare where these women love you and they yeah. care for you and they pick you up whenever you need them. And, you know, and you're with other kids and you're not yeah. watching TV all day. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's a bad thing for you to go to this place and for me to go to my place. And we're all learning mm -hmm. and then we can come together at night and have dinner and just continue to grow as a family. Yeah. And just looking at, like, I think it's easy to look at, oh, I want to be a doctor. Why am I not a doctor at this moment? Yeah. You know, and I think for that 18 to 34 range kids that you're talking to, I think they just look at these things as so massive and it needs to be immediate. I need to be rich right now. I need to be successful right now. My mom said I was going to be successful right out the gate. Like, why am I not successful? Why am I not a millionaire yet? Mm -hmm. You know, I, my heart breaks for these kids that have been overparented, yeah. um, and we are definitely trying not to overparent. Yeah. Well, I think you can never give too much love. Right. So don't, you know, and and particularly for a child who's had reason to question whether they are lovable, yeah. whether they are loved, whether they can trust what appears to be love. I think you've definitely you're trying to rebuild a foundation, and. Um, and love and trust, you know, are the are those building blocks in, in any family. And um, but then it's really this sort of humility of, I don't know who this kid is going to be. Let me mm -hmm. give you an example that I think really speaks to um, how families who foster and adopt can actually get it right, the parenting thing, mm -hmm. sooner than parents who only have bio kids. Okay. Um, and it's sort of similar to, well, it's, it's a, I was, there's, there's also a way in which parents of kids who have some kind of challenge, some kind of disability or, or learning difference or what have you mm -hmm. can learn sooner than parents of typically developing kids, that humility about like, yes. I, I can't shape them into this, that, and the right. other, mm -hmm. you know, this challenge is getting in the way I have to be invested in this kid, just becoming who they are, the mm -hmm. best version of themselves that they can achieve. So that's, that's a sort of secondary example. But the one that I want to hold on to here is um, I got a call from a mom who says, I've got a bio son, and I'm using this term. I've never used the, this term the way before, but I heard you say it, Jihei, you know, which is um, my bio kid, right? My, okay, right. so she's got a bio kid, mm -hmm. and she's got an adopted kid, and I'm doing this and this because the bio kid is two years older than the adopted kid. So they're both boys. The, so the bio son is 16, mm -hmm. so the adopted son is 14. And the bio son is in a therapeutic learning school, a therapeutic residential environment okay. away okay. from home. Mm -hmm. So they have family therapy once a week, let's say. And in family therapy, this mother calls me after family therapy with this aha moment she's had. She's like, Julie. And then therapy with my bio son. He says, mom, I need to tell you that every time you remind me to do something or every time you ask me have you done this yet it makes me feel like you think I can't do it mm. and your reminding me has become 
has made me worry I can't do it. And sometimes it makes me want to be resentful and rebel Mm -hmm. and say, fine, I'm not going to do it. If you think you have to care about this more than me, then fine. Like, you know, like his agency is trying to show up. I'm just going to like, you're not going to let me just do it or do it on my own terms. You feel the need to remind, I'm going to show up and show you, I am still in charge of my life by not doing it. You can see, right? So she gets it. She says, wow. First of all, he was right. I'm so embarrassed and ashamed and mortified, but I'm glad to know this. I need to work on this. And she says, Julie, I realize I'm not doing it with my adopted kid. Mm. She says, Julie, I feel responsible for my bio kid because he's got half of his genes or mine. Right. So who he is in the world, what he accomplishes at school. I feel like that's a reflection of who I am. So I'm trying to make sure. She says, with my adopted kid, I just love the heck out of that kid and want to just help him become who he is. Mm -hmm. I don't feel responsible. Psychologists would say she has the healthier relationship with her adopted son. Right, for sure. Because in this mother's mind, she has decided I have to shape and manage and Mm -hmm. micromanage my bio son because he's, you know, his genes are a reflection of who I am. Yep, right. And if we can get all parents to appreciate that healthy psychological distance with her adopted son, she loves the heck out of him and is trying to help him be who he is with no ego in it. Oh, yes. Uh, ego is not a part of his existence Mm -hmm. so she's able to just show up with love and be a caring adult who just loves this kid and wants to create whatever opportunities their lifestyle affords you know like but she's not owning it yeah she's treating him like a pet that she's gonna yank over here and make do this and our you know yeah it was beautiful and i think i hope people listening can appreciate that you know, this isn't about loving a child differently based on how they came into your life. Yeah. It's about sometimes your ego can be wrapped up in a child's existence and that harms them and it harms you as well. It's, it mm-hmm. bespeaks a harm within you. Yes. That's oh, yeah. worth talking to a therapist about. Why is my ego so intertwined with what this child does? Yeah. Yes. That's not healthy for either one of you. That is mm. so good. That's so good. Oh, man. That's called the mic drop, people. Wow. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. Yeah. I got chills. Yeah, that was incredible. Well, we're all doing it. Yeah. We're all doing it. Okay. I've written a book on the harm of overparenting, and I'm still trying to undo the overparenting that I've done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Working with my kids, and, you know, one is on a different path than the other, of course, and, and I, I'm sitting here as an expert, highly lauded in the intro to this podcast, but I'm here to say... I'm still learning very much in this mm-hmm. parenting space. I'm oh, trying sure. to undo the harmful patterns and set down more yep. healthy um, routines with my 21-year-old son okay. who has mental health challenges. Okay. I have his permission to say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we're trying to teach others as we teach ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are ways in which I have encroached upon his agency and trying to be so loving and helpful. Mm-hmm. Yes. I am a parent and I have seen the outcome mm-hmm. and I'm here to say, undo those patterns as early as you can it's harder and harder the older they are okay love it man julie thank you for your time i can't even we we are just so honored and humbled to have this conversation with you 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 are such an inspiration for both of us as as parents and as humans um just uh again going back to uh the real american book Mm -hmm. um it it moved both of us very much sharing your story and uh and how transparent you are and Mm -hmm. with all the different struggles you had especially for for someone like me um just seeing that perspective very different from how Mm -hmm. my my perspective growing up so um and and uh just love hearing your heart Mm -hmm. for for kids, for parents, for humans. Yes. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in any of her books, they are obviously available on Amazon. Although, do you have a better link? Yeah. Yes. Well, There's this amazing online org called bookshop.org. Okay. Okay. Bookshop. Or is it bookshop.com? I'm not sure. But basically, it's a way to order books online where a percentage of the proceeds go to independent booksellers okay so it's new it was launched uh, slightly before the pandemic and the pandemic has really been an opportunity because people are buying yes, online right. more. love that so it's really doing well so bookshop.org Good. or dot com yeah okay then we'll stop linking to amazon because jeff bezos does not need our money um <laughs> he's doing all right he's doing all right but also you can it pre-order. is bookshop.org i just great okay. 
yeah. So you can pre-order Julie's oh, new book um, on your turn. Your turn on your website. I we pre-ordered ours, so we're so excited. And, and we're actually going to uh, partner with Foster Arizona. They're a group out here that works a lot with kids that are aging out of foster care mm. and g being thrust into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And and so we're going to buy some ex a lot uh, extra copies of that book to give to them for the kids uh, going through that program. Um, yes. which I just think will be such a great opportunity to to reach uh, so many people. Mm -hmm. and... Well, that's so cool. And I would love to know more about that. And I'd love to maybe partner with you on that because I would like to see this book get into folks' hands. I mean, the opening story is when I talk about the guests on the page, mm -hmm. the very first guest on the page is a child who's in Appalachia whose mother okay. was addicted to opioids mm -hmm. and... Um, uh, he basically became the man of the house. And I think, not to say that everyone in foster care has dealt with addiction mm -hmm. in the family, yeah. but I think it's from the opening enough. pages to the closing, yes. who have had a tougher childhood yeah. are going to feel seen on these pages. Good. And um, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to depict the human experience as I describe a phase of life between childhood and death. You know, so right. I wanted everybody's story somehow to be there. So I'm excited for that. Yay. Well, that. we love that. Uh, so friends, thank you for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, I honestly don't really know how YouTube works. I you, thumbs up this video. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But for those of you who are listening on whatever podcast player you listen to, uh, if you want to leave us a review, that's great. Again, we encourage you to check out all of Julie's books. They are so literally life-changing yeah. and they will grow your mind. And I hope that for you, that you take into account what Julie said of like, what are you learning today? Mm -hmm. And so that is something that we are always trying to uh, do ourselves. And, you know, we're advocates for foster care and parent uh, adoption and foster care. And we've been doing it for a long time, but nothing in me thinks that we're doing it perfectly. No. Nothing in me thinks that we've arrived. No. Uh, so we definitely make mistakes all the time. Um, everyone is on a journey and I hope that we can all have open eyes to see that and not be the person who says, oh, so it's, what you're saying is I should neglect my kids. Like, let's not be idiots anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, can we take a moment and not put words into other people's mouths and just listen to the actual wisdom that's coming yeah. out of it? Yeah. What are we doing wrong? If you have a tinge of like, oh my goodness, like, I guess I do that. Or like, I feel offended. Why do I feel offended? Mm -hmm. Like, take, take a hot second, brew yourself some tea, sit outside, and think, why am I so offended right now? Yeah. Why am I so angry? Mm -hmm. Write it down, do a memoir, do a journal. Like it's a journey, we're all on a journey. Don't look at people and the page that they're on and say, man, you're a complete idiot. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, you're labeling these people. They're on a journey, you're on a journey. Let's all journey together kindly. I think a word that came up so often in today's podcast is kindness. Mm -hmm. And that is something yeah. that is lacking in our society. So can we be kind to ourselves and can we be kind to one another? Love it. So, you know, I quote Ram Das in the book and I'm just looking for his book on my bookshelf. Um, um, I quote him, um, Ram Das, be loved now. Mm. Um, and one of his favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes of his is we're all just walking each other home. Mm. Mm. I love that. That's beautiful. And that to me, is an exquisite summary of our human existence. We're all just walking each other home. And um, it is the walk itself that is, you know, we actually, we, you can't literally walk someone home and have them walk you home and that's mm -hmm. because they'll right. never get home, right? Right. It's not, it's the metaphor that, you know, it is the walk itself. Yeah. We are journeying with one another um, and we're all just walking each other home. We, you know, and I think it's beautiful and it's just, it's, uh, you know, I think when you decide to foster or adopt, you know, you are more intentional about that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm taking a child who arrived in this world as mm -hmm. belonging to somebody else and things didn't go the way they might have. And now I'm here right. and I'm trying to show up for this child and, uh, walk them home. And that implies safety and security and love and caring and deliberateness, intentionality, um, and uh but also humility right mm -hmm. so much humility yeah yeah yeah, yeah.
Oh man, I love it. Julie, we're going to have to have you on probably an episode every season from here on out. So just too good. It's too good. Yeah. And this well, conversation well, was too fun. It was so much fun. The two of you love your Midwestern Canadian accents. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out where y'all are from. You said Canada Toronto. Earlier. Toronto. From, but what about you? Chris? I'm actually uh, born and raised here in Arizona. You're kidding. You I'm sound like, fun. I'm like one of the very few that actually stayed here. Yeah. <laughs> he right. says stuff like crayons, crayons, or yeah, like yeah, he, he color says with crayons, crayons wrong, but it's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, I love it. Um, so, yeah, people, you guys can connect with Julie online. You can, again, buy her books. Mm-hmm. Um, and please... Can I pre- give social? What was that? Can I give my social? Yes. Oh, yeah, I'll yeah. link to all of that. And for those of you who are like, oh, are you just friends with Julie lithcott Hames? I mean, I am now. Yeah. But... Yes. We are friends, yeah. for sure. I love it. But uh, I legit just posted some stuff of yours because, again, we talk about your books all the time. And... You just, you like hearted one of the stories that I did of yours. Do you, are you it. in charge of your own Instagram? Yeah. Um, I do the responses. Someone else okay. usually handles the posting, cool. but yeah. Okay. Well, I your was... assistant is phenomenal too. Yeah. I'm a big fan of hers yes. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I did heart it. You hearted a story mention that I did and I was like, oh, I'm going to be audacious for a second here and ask if you'd like to be on our podcast. And you're like, oh, sure. I'll send you my email. I was like, Chris, oh my gosh, you will not believe, believe what her. happened today. I was today. like, yeah. This... I, this is the kind of thing I put my pants yeah. for sure. It was <laughs> insane. So this is like a dream come true. Like <laughs> I feel like I've arrived. We could probably end now, at 110. Remember we just talked about that. Oh, sorry. Just yeah. kidding. No one's arrived. We're yeah. all walking each other home. Yeah. Okay. But y- the fact that our journeys have coincided at this juncture. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I love incredible. your brown nail polish. Thank it you. It looks brown from here. Is Thank it brown? You. It is a, a little oh. bit brownie. Yeah, I'm pretending it's very fall, but again, it's still 90 something yeah, degrees. It's, not it's fall. totally working for you and for me. I'm loving it. I love it. I, Thank you. I, I do respond on social mm-hmm. yeah. because my work is to try to see humans. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm often on social looking for the people who are struggling, mm-hmm. not looking, but noticing, yeah. and then yeah. dropping a note. Mm-hmm. Because too much of social is a performance about, about oh, how totally. great everything is. And when someone actually shows up with, a fear, a sadness, you know, a, a sort of a vulnerable share. I try to be there and just, you know, just comment. And, um, and if someone's going to reach out to me and say, Hey, I want to, you know, we do this podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm intrigued. I want to, you know, I, I'm, you're excited that I hearted you. I was excited that you liked my stuff and oh, I'm no better than you or no more important than you. You're doing amazing work and mm-hmm. you honor me by having me here. And um, so this is very mutual. I just want you, you to know that. <laughs> it's not like, okay, fine, I'm gonna be on you know, their <laughs> podcast. I actually was excited. And when I saw it in my calendar, I was like, oh, today's the day I get to be with the, you know, the people who are foster parents and have a mm-hmm. podcast on that. This is special for me. Well, thank um, you. So thank you. Well, that means a lot. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, friends, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. It's probably not a chance that you did. It's impossible. But it's fine. I hope you came in close second to how much I enjoyed it. Yeah, Um, this was amazing. Julie, thanks again. You're just a rock star. Anything you write, anytime you want to come back and visit us, you have an open invitation to come on any episode you want. Thank you. I will be back. If you want me back, I will come back. Oh, we do. You're fun. Thank, hey, you so thank you, Julie. It was so great talking with you. Yeah. And thank you to our listeners. Uh, we hope you were inspired uh, by this conversation as we were. Yes. And we hope that you guys have a great week, a great uh, season off, right? Mm-hmm. This is the season finale. So uh, we'll be back with you next season shortly. Love it.